chief guest dr shashi tarur while we wait for the chief guest dr shashi tadur a few tips about him he is not just well known as a member of parliament he is the chairman of the standing committee on information technology in fact dr shashi tadur was a pioneer in using social media as an instrument of political interaction He was India's most followed politician on Twitter until 2013 when he was overtaken by the prime minister
respected chief guests, eminent dignitaries, a wonderful morning to one and all. We are extremely delighted to be here with all of you for the Abu Sabah Extension Lecture on India Tomorrow, which is hosted by FASA in connection with Platinum Jubilee celebrations of Farooq College. Farooq College began its journey from the year 1948 and ever since, it has been charging ahead untiringly to its vision of an uplifted and socially committed community. Farooq College owes a lot to many noble hearts of an uplifted and socially committed community who have been working together. The beneficent souls of the past who strived a lot to establish the institution is a commendable memory. Farooq College has the name of conquering higher education goals of this country. We are constantly working towards realizing it in the near future. We are pleased to have been applauded by various agencies like MHRD, RUSA, NAC, FIST, etc. Every achievement is an inspiration for reaching better targets in the days to come. Farooq College helps nurture generations of citizens who will benefit by our village vigilance and care. This college has a lot more to offer to society. It's actively emerging as a hub catering to academics, interdisciplinary studies and research. As part of Abu Sabah Extension Lecture on India Today, hosted by FOSSA in connection with Platinum Jubilee celebrations of Farooq College, we are truly honored to have Dr. Shashi Tharoor, Member of Parliament, to deliver the Abu Sabah Extension Lecture on India Tomorrow. On behalf of FOSSA, Farooq College Old Students Association, the members of the management committee, staff and students of Farooq College, we welcome our chief guest, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, to Abu Sabah Extension Lecture. The reaction of the audience is echoing our delight. We will begin. We request everyone to kindly rise for the prayer. It will be rendered by Ms. Adira Ramesh, our MLIC student and member of Vibes Music Club of College. Alam dayalu Varunurishwaran Tirunamatil Alam Dayalu Vaidakshin Aliai Varunurishwaran Tirunamatil Nikila Lokangalkum Ekarakshakanagum Akilishwaran Alayo Sakalas to theum Akileshwaran Alayo Sakalas to theum Paramakarum Yavan Karunani Vidi Parayam Divasatin Nikadipani Niyadamara de Punyang Alangae Matram Sadadam Sahayamati Padum Tirumumbil Naikidam Yangale Niraya Margatil Ninanu Krahapatra Mayurthan Margatil Angayal Kobi Kepeto Rude Variel San Marka Brushter than Varino Malla Alam Dayalu Varunurishwaran Tirunamatil Nikila Logangalkum Ekarakshakanagum Akileshwaran Alayo Sakalas to theum Akileshwaran Alayo Sakalas to theum Akileshwaran Alayo Sakalas to theum
College Geetam always invokes a sense of belonging and inspiration to greater heights. Lend your ears to Faru College Geetam.
Our principal is an embodiment of steadfast courage and untiring efforts to keep the academic achievements held high. His leadership and untiring work is taking Farooq College to an inimitable position in the national scenario. It's with joy that I invite our principal of Farooq College, Dr. K. M. Nasir, to deliver the principal's address. Very good morning to you all. Priyapattavire. Faru College in the principal and the lake. Era Sandosha today. Adilere Abhimana today. Nyani Vedil in the Gundaningale Abhimiri Kinata. Iriti Tola Iriti Nalpatiatil. Namada Priyapattajatina. Swadhan Dhani Lepi Chathin Dei Thotta Ditta Varsham Iri Mooli Parambu Enna Peri Lari Petiri Na E Pradheshatthu Raulutul Uluum Athava Vijnanath Inde Poondopu Enna Artham Viri Na Nama Granam Nadatthi Padityandu Galai Kerala Tindde Vidya Piasa Samu Higa, Samskariga Rengatu Valia Navothanathina Nedutum Nelgia Vira Maha Prasthana Mana, Faru College Egyptian in Alazar Sarvagala Shale Ilina Uberi Patanam Karina Natalek Teacher Narishitulinaya Abu Sabah Adehat in the Sopna Mana Faru College Kerala Tinde Nima Sabha Speaker Veria Irina KM Sidi Sahib in Dayim Hydros Vakil in Dayim Mata Dehat in Day Suhurta Kaludayim Srema Palamaitana E. Mahastavanam Stabita Maitha Ninda Edvati and the Varsanga Namal Pinitikian Pindirin Okumbo Namukabhimanikan Ere Yunda Inna India Ile Etevum Sradheya Maya College Galilona Imaran Faru College in a Karinitunda NAC accreditation RM Bicha the Mudal Adit the five star accreditation Mudal in the Vere Moon Cycle Ilum NAC accreditation the winner of the Padavigal Nadi Dekan Namukarinitunda Kadinya Moon of Samai to Todar Sene in a year of Franking Ill India Ile Etum Megetsa Noor College Gulilonai Faro College Stanam Peditunda Yemetsa Deed and Edutil Ere IA Tigalum Bangalore Indian Institute of Science and Gude, Rubanguduta, NPTL, National Program on Digitally Enhanced Learning. Adil and Alai Reti Anur Lera Verena College Chapter Gulil, India Hille, Triple A Grade Odu Gude, Eto Migetsa Path College Gulilonaitana, Faru College Ipo Idan Nadi Rikinata. Kala Rangatum, Kaiger Rangatum, Faru College in the Prepata Vidyartigal Kerala Til Ajayamana in the Prakabik and the Ruba Thrilla Performance Sana, Narate Kundrikinata Kalikati University in their zone Lokayum Yenum Kiridum Chudar Lada Namuda College and Kaiger Rangatta Migetsa Samhavan and Algan Olympian Mara Sushikan Vere Faru College in a Sathya Maitunda Yang dirgi pikir ni lah. Inna, nama dek kolej jele kete petit dalat logam mudik ke sedhi kena uru maha vikti tu tinu deme ya. India ada rikinna, Kerala ya nabhiman maai kondar dina, bhuman ya naya asisi teriur. Adi maite, 
ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജിലെ അധ്യാപകരുടെയും അനധ്യാപകരുടെയും മാനേജ്മെൻറ്റിൻ്റെയും ഞങ്ങളുടെ പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളുടെയും പേരിൽ അവരുടെ സ്നേഹവും ആദരവുകളും അർപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂരിനെ അഭിവാദ്യം ചെയ്യാൻ ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരം ഉപയോഗിക്കുകയാണ് സർ ഇത് വെറും വാക്കുകളല്ല ഇന്ത്യയിൽ നിന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾ പ്രതീക്ഷയോടുകൂടെ കാണുന്ന ശബ്ദം അങ്ങയുടേതാണ് ഇന്ത്യൻ പാർലമെൻറ്റിൽ അഞ്ഞൂറ്റി നാൽപ്പതോളം അംഗങ്ങൾ ഇരിക്കുമ്പോൾ അവരെ നിശബ്ദമാക്കുന്ന രൂപത്തിലുള്ള അങ്ങയുടെ പെർഫോമൻസ് ഞങ്ങൾ ഒത്തിരി കണ്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് പക്ഷേ അതിലെല്ലാം ഉപരിയായിട്ട് ഇന്ന് ഇന്ത്യ അനുഭവിച്ചു കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്ന വേദനകൾക്കും യാതനകൾക്കും അപ്പുറത്ത് സ്വപ്നം ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് നൽകുന്നത് താങ്കളെ പോലെയുള്ള നേതാക്കളാണ് എന്ന് പറയാൻ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് മടിയില്ല വൈ ഐ ആം എ ഹിന്ദു എന്ന അങ്ങയുടെ പുസ്തകം വായിച്ചപ്പോൾ ഒരു കാര്യം ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് മനസ്സിലായി എന്താണ് ഹിന്ദു ആരാണ് ഹിന്ദു എന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് മനസ്സിലായി ആം എ ഹിന്ദു ആം എ നാഷണലിസ്റ്റ് ബട്ട് ഐ എം നോട്ട് എ ഹിന്ദു നാഷണലിസ്റ്റ് എന്ന് പ്രഖ്യാപിച്ചതിലൂടെ വർത്തമാനകാല ഭാരതത്തിൻ്റെ കുത്സിത ശ്രമങ്ങൾക്ക് ഹിന്ദുത്വത്തിനൊക്കെയും കൃത്യമായ മറുപടി കൊടുക്കാൻ അങ്ങേക്ക് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ട് കേട്ടിട്ടുണ്ട് സാർ അങ്ങയുടെ പിതാവ് ജാതിവാല് മുറിച്ചുകൊണ്ടാണ് പൊതുജീവിതം ആരംഭിച്ചതെന്ന് ആ ഒരു പാരമ്പര്യം അങ്ങയിൽ പൂർണ്ണമായിട്ടും ലഭ്യമായിരിക്കുന്നു എന്നുള്ളതിൽ ഇന്ത്യക്കാരൻ എന്നുള്ള നിലയ്ക്ക് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് അഭിമാനമുണ്ട് പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഈ കാലഘട്ടത്തിൽ നമുക്കറിയാവുന്നതാണ് ദ പാരഡോക്സിക്കൽ പ്രൈം മിനിസ്റ്റർ എന്ന പേരിൽ പുസ്തകം എഴുതാൻ ഇന്ന് ഭാരതത്തിൽ ഇന്ത്യയിൽ അല്ല ലോകത്ത് തന്നെ ഒരാൾ ധൈര്യം കാണിക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിനെ കേവല ധൈര്യം എന്നല്ല പറയേണ്ടത് എന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾക്കറിയാം ആ പാരഡോക്സിക്കൽ പ്രൈം മിനിസ്റ്ററുടെ ചെയ്തുകളെക്കുറിച്ചൊക്കെയും കൃത്യമായിട്ട് അറിയാവുന്ന അങ്ങേ പോലെ ഒരാൾ ആ പുസ്തകം എഴുതിയപ്പോൾ ഞങ്ങൾ സ്തബ്ധരായി പോയിട്ടുണ്ട് അതിലേറെ ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് അഭിമാനം തോന്നിയിട്ടുണ്ട് ജനാധിപത്യത്തിൻ്റെ നെടുംതൂണുകളായ നമ്മുടെ ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂഷൻസിനൊക്കെയും നമ്മുടെ ജുഡീഷ്യറിയെ നമ്മുടെ ജുഡീഷ്യറിക്ക് സമാനമായി നിൽക്കുന്ന മറ്റ് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂഷൻസ് അതൊക്കെയും സ്വന്തം വരുതിയിലേക്ക് വരുത്താനുള്ള തീവ്രശ്രമം നമ്മുടെ ഭരണകൂടം നടത്തിക്കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുമ്പോൾ അതിനെതിരിടുന്നവർക്ക് പ്രതീക്ഷയായിട്ട് പ്രത്യാശയായിട്ട് സാറിനെ പോലെയുള്ളവർ പാർലമെൻറ്റിൽ ഉണ്ട് എന്നുള്ളതാണ് ഞങ്ങളുടെ പ്രതീക്ഷ തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും അതിൽ ഞങ്ങൾ അഭിമാനം കൊള്ളുകയും ചെയ്യുന്നു കാരണം അങ്ങ് ജയിച്ചു പോയിട്ടുള്ളത് കേരളത്തിൽ നിന്നാണ് കേരളത്തിൻ്റെ തലസ്ഥാന നഗരിയാണ് അങ്ങയെ തിരഞ്ഞെടുത്തിട്ടുള്ളത് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഇത് വലിയൊരു അംഗീകാരമാണ് കേരളത്തിന് വലിയ അംഗീകാരമാണ് ഞാൻ പലപ്പോഴും ചിന്തിച്ചിട്ടുണ്ട് ഇന്നത്തെ നമ്മുടെ ഈ ഭരണകൂടത്തിൻ്റെ കൂടെ നിൽക്കുകയാണെങ്കിൽ ലഭിക്കുമായിരുന്ന ലഭിക്കുമായിരുന്ന എല്ലാ അവസരങ്ങളെയും പൂർണ്ണമായിട്ടും അങ്ങ് തൃണവൽഗണിക്കുന്നത് ജനാധിപത്യത്തിനോടും മതേതരത്വത്തിനോടുമുള്ള അങ്ങയുടെ ജന്മന അങ്ങേക്ക് ലഭ്യമായ അഭിനിവേശമാണ് എന്ന് ഞാൻ മനസ്സിലാക്കുകയാണ് സർ ജവഹർലാൽ നെഹ്റുവിനെ കാണാൻ ഞങ്ങളുടെ തലമുറയ്ക്ക് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടില്ല ജവഹർലാൽ നെഹ്റുവിനെ നേരിട്ട് കേൾക്കാനും ഞങ്ങളുടെ തലമുറയ്ക്ക് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ടില്ല പക്ഷേ ലോകം കണ്ട ലോകം കണ്ട ആദരണീയനായ ഫിലോസഫറായ എക്കാലത്തെയും ഇന്ത്യയുടെ പ്രഗത്ഭനായ പ്രധാനമന്ത്രി ഇന്ത്യ ഭാവി ഭാരതം കെട്ടിപ്പടുക്കുന്നതിൽ കൃത്യമായ പങ്കുവഹിച്ച പ്രധാനമന്ത്രി ജവഹർലാൽ നെഹ്റു ആ ജവഹർലാൽ നെഹ്റുവിൻ്റെ പിന്മുറക്കാരനായിട്ട് സർ ഞങ്ങൾ താങ്കളെ കാണുകയാണ് താങ്കളുടെ സാന്നിധ്യം തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ആ നെഹ്റുവ്യസത്തിലേക്കുള്ള അത് കടന്നു പോക്കായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കുകയാണ് ഞാൻ ദീർഘിപ്പിക്കുന്നില്ല ഒരിക്കലൂടെ ഒരിക്കലൂടെ ഈ കോളേജിലേക്ക് വരാൻ ഞങ്ങളുടെ പ്രിയപ്പെട്ട വിദ്യാർത്ഥികളുമായിട്ട് സംവദിക്കാൻ അങ്ങ് കാണിച്ച ആ മഹാമനസ്കഥയ്ക്ക് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും നന്ദി പറയാൻ കൂടെ ഞാൻ ഈ അവസരം ഉപയോഗപ്പെടുത്തുകയാണ് അതേപോലെ തന്നെ അങ്ങയെ ഇങ്ങോട്ട് ക്ഷണിച്ചത് ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജ് ഓൾഡ് സ്റ്റുഡൻസ് അസോസിയേഷനാണ് ലോകത്ത് ഇന്ത്യക്ക് വെളിയിലായിട്ട് പതിനാലോളം ചാപ്റ്ററുകൾ കൃത്യമായിട്ട് പ്രവർത്തിച്ചു കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ഫോസയ്ക്ക് അതേപോലെ തന്നെ ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജിൽ പഠിച്ചിറങ്ങിയവർ ലോകത്തിന് ചുറ്റുമായിട്ടൊന്ന് ജീവിച്ചു കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ഈ കഴിഞ്ഞ ഇന്നലെയിൽ ഒരു ഫേസ്ബുക്ക് പോസ്റ്റ് വൈറലാവുന്നത് സാറും ശ്രദ്ധിച്ചിരിക്കും കേരളത്തിൻ്റെ മൗലിക പ്രതിഭ വൈക്കം മുഹമ്മദ് ബഷീറിൻ്റെ ചരമദിനം ഇന്നലെയായിരുന്നു ആ ചരമദിനത്തിൽ ഹിന്ദു പത്രത്തിലെ ഒരു റിപ്പോർട്ടർ ഹിന്ദു പത്രത്തിലെ ഒരു ജേർണലിസ്റ്റ് അദ്ദേഹത്തിൻ്റെ ഒരു അനുഭവം പങ്കുവെക്കുന്നുണ്ട് ഇറാനിലെ വടക്ക് കിഴക്കൻ പ്രവിശ്യയിലൂടെ അദ്ദേഹം സഞ്ചരിച്ചു കൊണ്ടിരിക്കുമ്പോൾ ബഷീറിനെ അറിയാവുന്ന 
ഇതേപോലെ അന്താരാഷ്ട്ര തലത്തിൽ ഒത്തിരി പേര് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് സംഭാവന ചെയ്തവരുണ്ട് വേദനയോടുകൂടെ ഞങ്ങൾ ഓർക്കുന്ന മറ്റു പേരുകളുണ്ട് ബാഗ്ദാദിൽ അമേരിക്ക ബോംബ് വർഷിച്ചപ്പോൾ രണ്ടായിരത്തി മൂന്ന് അങ്ങേക്ക് ഓർമ്മയുണ്ടാവും ബാഗ്ദാദിൽ അമേരിക്ക ബോംബ് വർഷിച്ചപ്പോൾ അൽ ജസീറ ടി വിയുടെ ജേർണലിസ്റ്റ് അവിടെ ആ ബോംബിന് അടിപ്പെട്ട് മരി മരണപ്പെട്ടു പോയിരുന്നു ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ രാജകവാടം കടന്നുപോയ താരിഖ് അയ്യൂബ് എന്ന് ഞങ്ങളുടെ പൂർവ്വ വിദ്യാർത്ഥിയായിരുന്നു അത് ഇന്ന് ഞങ്ങൾ വേദനയോടുകൂടെ ഓർമ്മിക്കുന്ന നാമമാണ് അങ്ങനെ അന്താരാഷ്ട്ര വേദികളിലേക്കൊക്കെയും ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജിൻ്റെ വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾ ഒത്തിരി പേരുണ്ട് തീർച്ചയായിട്ടും ഇതിനൊക്കെയും നേതൃത്വം നൽകുന്നത് ഫോസ എന്ന സംഘടനയാണ് ആ സംഘടനയുടെ പേരിലാണ് എഴുപത്തഞ്ച് വർഷത്തിലെത്തി നിൽക്കുന്ന ഫാറൂഖ് കോളേജ് അതിൻ്റെ പ്ലാറ്റിനം ജൂബിലി സെലിബ്രേഷൻ്റെ ഭാഗമായിട്ട് ഞങ്ങളുടെ സ്ഥാപകനായ അബു സബാഹിനെ ഓർമ്മിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഇത്തരത്തിലുള്ള ഒരു പരിപാടി സംഘടിപ്പിച്ചിട്ടുള്ളത് ആ പരിപാടിക്ക് ഞങ്ങൾക്ക് ലഭിക്കാവുന്ന ഏറ്റവും മികച്ച അതിഥിയെ ലഭിച്ചതിലുള്ള സന്തോഷം ഒരിക്കലൂടെ പങ്കുവെച്ചുകൊണ്ട് അങ്ങേക്ക് വേണ്ടി വേദിയിൽ നിന്ന് വിടവാങ്ങട്ടെ ജയ് ഹിന്ദ് താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ യുവർ ഇൻസ്റ്റിമുലേറ്റിംഗ് അഡ്രസ് ഓൾവേസ് മേ ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ആ പ്രിൻസിപ്പൾ ടു റിമെയിൻ ഓൺ സ്റ്റേജ് വിത്ത് ഗ്രേറ്റ് പ്ലാഷർ മേ ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് ദി പ്രസിഡന്റ് ഓഫ് ഫറൂഖ് കോളേജ് മാനേജിംഗ് കമ്മിറ്റി ജനാബ് പി കെ അഹമ്മദ് സാഹിബ് മാനേജർ ജനാബ് സി പി കുഞ്ഞു മുഹമ്മദ് സാഹിബ് ആൻഡ് ഫോസർ പ്രസിഡന്റ് ജനാബ് കെ കുഞ്ഞലവി സാഹിബ് ടു അക്കമ്പനി ആർ ചീഫ് ഗെസ്റ്റ് ഡോക്ടർ ശശി തരൂർ ഓൺ ടു ദ സ്റ്റേജ് Our manager, Jinnab C.P. Kunju Mohamed, is heading several prestigious institutions and organizations. In addition to his corporate affairs, we are pleased to have you here with us. May I now request FOSA President Jinnab K. Kunjalvi Sahib to officially welcome our chief guest, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, for the Abu Sabah Extension Lecture. May I request Faruk College Managing Committee President Jinnab P K Ahmed Sahib who is ever cheerful in inspiring a presence to adorn our chief guest Dr Shashi Tharoor with a shawl on behalf of Faruk College Management Committee Now we move onwards with Abu Sabah Extension Lecture as part of FOSA Platinum Jubilee Celebrations. Dr. Shashi Tharoor is an Indian former international diplomat, politician, writer and public intellectual who has served as Member of Parliament for Tiruvannathapuram since 2009. He was formerly Under Secretary General of Indian United Nations and ran for the post of Secretary General in 2006. Born in London, UK and raised in India, Shashi Tharoor graduated from St. Stephen's College, Delhi and earned a doctorate in International Relations and Affairs from Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy. At the age of 22, he was the youngest person to receive such an honour. with due honor and respect we now welcome our eminent chief guest dr shashi tharoor to address the gathering and deliver the extension lecture thank you very very much it's wonderful to see such a huge audience here this morning at this prestigious institution i am touched i am delighted to see you all here I know that Farooq College has been trying to get me to come for quite some time and I am delighted to have been able to accept this invitation at the commencement of your 75th year. What a special year and what a special occasion to be with such special people as all of you. Thank you.
I know uh, that you have produced a number of distinguished alumni, even in the world of politics. My late parliamentary colleague, M.I. Shahnawaz, used to be a student union leader at this college. Uh, I've been accompanied today by Sa Ahmed Saju of the Muslim League. He's somebody who has also uh, recently graduated from your college. So I've seen across the generations, I think Mr. Kunyali Kutti, a number of other leaders have proudly said that they have come from Farooq College. So clearly this is a college that incubates the leaders of India tomorrow. And that's who I'm addressing today. And I therefore want to say that whatever I say is going to be really the view of one individual because our India has to be made up of many voices, many individuals, and many dreams that we must all dream with our eyes open. When I think of India, I marvel also that we have created over the last 75 years, this extraordinary country. When we were about to get independence, Winston Churchill, that notorious colonialist imperialist had barked, India is no more a country than the equator. He said that it is a collection of different places that will not hang together. There is only the British that were holding us together. And it's a matter of pride for all of us that for 75 years, we, the people of India have not only held together, but we have built an astonishingly successful republic, a country that has pulled together such a large number of people flourishing in such extraordinary diversity that we have been able as a result to, do, to develop, to grow, to make literate, to increase the prosperity of such a large number of people in a diverse democracy. This is no small matter. This is actually a very, very considerable accomplishment. When you think back to the circumstances of 1947, to the horrors of partition, the tragedy of the killings, perhaps up to one million people were killed, to the horrors and the misfortunes that faced the country in terms of the destruction of property, the damage done to our institutions and infrastructure, the carving up of the land into two separate countries. All of this had left us in many ways in a shambles. And if you look at the writings about India at that time, everyone thought that India could not stay united that India could not prosper, that India would not be democratic, and Indians proved all those predictions wrong. We have not only stayed together, we have been able to take a country which the British left at less than 16% literacy, and we have brought it up to over 72% today. We have taken a country where the life expectancy was only 27 that is, the average Indian born in this country could only expect to live 27 years, the average, because of course there was such a high level of infant mortality and maternal mortality. And today, our life expectancy is about 70 because we've reduced all that mortality. We have been able to manage our diversity. There were secessionist movements in different parts of the country. We have been able to end them and heal them and bring them together into the grand adventure that is Indian democracy. And all this has been made possible because we have agreed to dream the same dream. Our founding fathers and mothers way back in the 1940s, they had a vision of India and we have given passports to their dreams. Today as I was coming here, the media caught me to talk about a controversy involving the constitution. And I was telling them what an extraordinary achievement the Constitution was. For three years, our people sat down together and discussed everything that should go into making India the country it is today. Some people said, oh, Pakistan has been created for Muslims, let us make India into a country for Hindus. That was debated, it was rejected. People said, no, our freedom struggle was for everyone and our country will be for everyone. They decided that even though there had been a tendency under British rule to see India as a collection of groups of communities, that our constitution would empower the individual. 
that the individual citizen would get autonomy and authority and be able to grow and develop and fulfill her own potential. This kind of strength was a choice that Indians made. Nobody made it for us. Our own constituent assembly sat down, discussed every issue point by point. Dr. Ambedkar, as chairman of the drafting committee, patiently answered every question, every objection. And at the end of it, we have a constitution made by Indians for Indians. And today, that is more than 72 years after the constitution was adopted and 75 years after our independence, we can celebrate the India of today and look forward to the India of tomorrow. What do you want to see in this India of tomorrow? The answer, my dear young people, is up to you. Because India of tomorrow is your India, not of mine, not of the distinguished gentlemen who were on stage with me a few minutes ago. And that's why today, rather than giving you a long lecture, I would rather answer your questions. I would rather interact with you, so I hope you will think about what's on your mind. So that I will not spend the whole time lecturing you, I will instead listen to what you have to say. I will give you your reply then. But the purpose is you tell us, because ours is a country where the young people are being ruled by old men and women, especially men. And I think they need to listen to what the young people want to see in the India of tomorrow. I want to tell you what I would like to say. I would like to see, of course, a united India. I would like to see an India where every individual Indian is free to pursue their own dreams and hopes. Not an Indian where the government interferes and tells you who, what you can eat, who you can love, where you can live, what kind of work you can do. I want the government out of the kitchen, out of the bedroom, out of the dining room. Government has no place there. Politicians have no place there. Let people live their own lives as they wish. And let us learn to celebrate our great difference. Acceptance of difference has been a hallmark and a strength of Indian civilization for 3,000 years. And it will be our strength in the future if we allow that. If we start imposing one narrow view of what India is all about, and we allow those who claim to be offended by any other view to dominate our discourse, then the India of tomorrow will not be an India we will be able to celebrate. Secondly, it's important that we have an India where every Indian can take for granted three meals a day, can be able to have a roof over their head against rain and sun, will be able to live and breathe normally in an atmosphere of freedom, express their views, be able to relate to their fellow citizens, and an India where at the end of the day, each person can aspire to a better life than what they were born into and what they were born with. That is a very simple aspiration to have. And it seems to me that that is the best that a government can offer. When people tell me, oh, we have to be like China, or we have to be like America, I say, no. As long as we can be India, and as long as every Indian can lead a decent life, without having to struggle against impossible odds and forces, I don't care how other countries are living. Let them live happily in their own way, provided our people can live happily in their own way. That is a very simple yardstick I want. I don't feel that growth and development and prosperity needs to be a competition or a race with some other country. We are different from other countries. Somebody was saying to me, you know, China went from zero kilometers of six lane highways in 1995 to 150,000 kilometers of six lane highways just 20 years later in 2015. And I said, yes, that's true. But in China, you can draw a line on the map and bulldoze everything in your path. No one has any rights to stop you. In India, you try and widen a two-lane road in Kerala, and what will you get? 
you will have objections you will have people refusing to sell you the land you will have red flags coming in protest you will have court cases and as the expression goes we are like this only we are a different country we are not going to be china we should not measure ourselves by the yardsticks of china but what we do is we take everyone along ellavarum kooti kondu varuna oru valarchana nammalle vendathu nammalku aavashyamulla vikasanam എല്ലാവരുടെയും ഒപ്പം ചെയ്യുന്ന വികസനമാണ് വേണ്ടത് അതിൽ നമ്മുടെ ഭരിക്കുന്ന ബി ജെ പിക്കാർ സബ് കാ സാത് സബ് കാ വികാസ് എന്ന് പറയുമ്പോൾ എനിക്ക് വലിയ ഒബ്ജക്ഷൻ ഒന്നുമില്ല കാരണം എല്ലാവരുടെ ഒപ്പം വരുന്ന വളർച്ച എല്ലാവരുടെ ഒപ്പം വരുന്ന വികസനമാണ് ഈ രാജ്യത്ത് ആവശ്യമുള്ളത് അത് അവർ ചെയ്യേണ്ടോ വേറെ പലരും ചെയ്യേണ്ടോ അത് വേറെ പ്രശ്നമാണ് ഞാൻ ഇവിടെ നിന്ന് രാഷ്ട്രീയം പറയാനല്ല നിൽക്കുന്നത് പക്ഷേ നമ്മുടെ നാടിനെ നന്നാക്കണം എന്നുണ്ടെങ്കിൽ നമ്മളെല്ലാവരുടെയും അഭിപ്രായം അറിഞ്ഞിട്ടും നമ്മളെല്ലാവരുടെയും ഒപ്പം കൺസൾട്ടേഷൻ നടത്തി മുന്നോട്ട് പോകാനുള്ള രാജ്യ രാഷ്ട്രീയമാണ് നമ്മുടെ രാജ്യത്ത് ആവശ്യമുള്ളത് ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് വാട്ട് ഐ വോണ്ട് ടു സി ഇൻ ദി ഇന്ത്യ ടു മോൾ ആൻഡ് ദെൻ എസ് ഫാർ ഇസ് എഡ്യൂക്കേഷൻ ഇസ് കൺസേൺഡ് ഐ വോണ്ട് ടു സി എൻ ഇന്ത്യ വെ ഓൾ ഓഫ് യു കെൻ സ്റ്റഡി സബ്ജെക്ട്സ് ദാറ്റ് വിൽ കണ്ടിന്യൂ ടു ബി റെലവൻറ്റ് ഈവൻ ആസ് ദ വേൾഡ് ചേഞ്ചസ് ഇൻ ഗ്രോസ് ആൻഡ് ഇവോൾവ്സ് Do you know there was a study in the Oxford Martin School in 2030 that said that 30% of the jobs that will be available in 2030 will be jobs that do not exist today that is there are going to be new ways of doing things new inventions artificial intelligence robotics got to it's going to change the workplace and the result is going to be that there will be jobs for which you cannot study today because those jobs don't exist today so how do you prepare today's children for the jobs and the marketplace of tomorrow i always say to teachers do not teach the children what to think teach the children how to think ultimately it is how you think about things that will prepare you for those jobs that don't exist today how do you grasp unfamiliar information understand it learn to see patterns in it learn to understand problems and draw conclusions from them if you know how to do that then it won't matter what new inventions come because you will have the mental equipment to adjust to new ways of seeing and doing things we cannot remain anchored in the present when we speak of the india of tomorrow we must instinctively accept it cannot be the india of today so to give you an example from the past do you know that when movies first came cinema they were silent movies and therefore in every theater where a silent movie was screened there was an orchestra pit right in front there and live musicians would pay would play music to accompany each performance each screening of a silent movie now imagine when talkies came that is when motion pictures came with a soundtrack and they had their own sound do you realize how many lakhs of musicians lost their jobs because once you had sound and music on the soundtrack of the cinema no movie theater needed to hire an orchestra anymore so tens of thousands of lakhs of people lost their jobs did anyone say no 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 we can't have sound in the movies we have to protect the jobs of the orchestra they adjusted and the orchestra musicians had to go and find something else to do so we are looking at a situation in which sorry <laughs> thank you we're looking at a situation in which major change will be disruptive but if those poor orchestra musicians didn't know anything else but how to play or music during a silent movie they would have had no future our students of today must be prepared for a tomorrow in which they may have to adjust dramatically let me give you another example that will be relevant to many of the young people here do you know at the beginning of the century there was a new sunrise industry called medical transcription you know what that is an american doctor would see his patients in america 
he would dictate his notes into a computer. The notes would be zinged over with undersea cables on the internet overnight to India. When the doctor went to sleep in America, a qualified Indian with some medical education who understood the relevant terms would type up the notes and send them back. So the next morning when the American doctor wake up, woke up and came to his clinic, he had all the notes of his patients the previous day typed by somebody sitting in India. That was called medical transcription. And it became a huge industry for a short while. Why? Because for the doctors, it was far more efficient than finding the time to dictate to a secretary in America. The secretary there had a higher salary, needed leave, needed sick leave, needed holidays, needed working hours, all those limitations. Then she might have made mistakes. He would have to correct them. There would be other further delays. Now, he sent it all off, forgot about it. The next day he got it back and there was no problem. It was a wonderful business and India became the world leader in medical transcription. So the result was that Indians not only cornered the market, 95%, but it became a big growing industry. They started hiring Indians fresh out of college, set them up in various places, Chennai and Bangalore and Gurgaon and Hyderabad and so on, to do medical transcription. And people said, wonderful, wonderful, what a lovely business, we can make money for a long time to come. They were wrong because they did not anticipate the development of sufficient artificial intelligence capabilities that voice recognition software became so good that the American doctor no longer needed to dictate his notes and send them to India. He could buy software once, he would speak into his machine and the words would appear on the screen even as he spoke because of voice recognition technology and the bottom dropped out of the medical transcription business. No longer did anyone need to send these notes to India. No longer could Indians make money typing these notes. A one-time investment of software gave the American doctor everything he needed. And medical transcription from being a sunrise industry became a sunset industry. It was over. And the result was what? That suddenly all these people who thought they had a secure career for the next 30, 40 years in medical transcription, had to find something else to do. That is the world of tomorrow that you are all come to be graduating from. When you're looking for work in these fast changing industries, be prepared for change. Be prepared for adjustment. Be prepared to think that as long as you have confidence in your basic abilities, that you will find yourself doing things differently time after time after time. And that, to my mind, is the most essential message I can leave you with for the India of tomorrow, along with one more. And that is very simply, let our India of tomorrow be an India where we see, all of us, what unites us and not what divides us. Let us be a country. <coughs> Let us be a country where we recognize that we have very, very many ways of seeing the same thing. There are very, very many ways of worshipping what we think of as the divine force in our lives. Whether you call Allah or Bhagwan in various ways, whether you go to temples or mosques or gurdwaras or churches, ultimately at the end of the day, you're all reaching out to the same unknowable mystery of creation. There is no reason for any one of us to think that he or she should judge somebody else because they worship differently from us. If God has made us, he has also made us to be very different from each other in this regard. There is no cause for judgment. Be who you are, be the best version of yourself that you can be and let others have the same privilege of being who they are. Swami Vivekanand taught me as a very young person from his earlier writings. Thank you. As he taught us all, thank you very much. As he taught us all, the most important thing to recognize is that no one has a monopoly of the truth. 
So I believe you, I have the truth, you believe you have the truth. I will respect your truth. Please respect my truth. And in that way, we will be able to live in an India of mutual respect, of mutual acceptance, and we can go forward together. Ultimately, the great beauty of India is that our diversity has so far been a source of strength for us and not a source of division. There is a little island off the coast of Gujarat called Diu. You go there and you will see a memorial to the ship INS Kukri, which is the only ship that was sunk in the 1971 war with Pakistan. The captain of that ship was Captain Mullah. He stayed till the end and went down with the ship. But all the sailors and soldiers on that ship, every one of their names is recorded in that memorial. And you look at that memorial and you see the names of Indians of every religion, of every community, of every part of the country, from north and south and east and west. People who raise their hands in prayer to Allah, people who raise their hands in prayer to Jesus or Jehovah, and people who raise their hands in prayer to thousands, who bowed in prayer to thousands of versions of Hindu gods. Ultimately, none of that mattered. In the service of India, they were all Indian. And that ultimately is the message I leave you all with. We must learn that if India of tomorrow is to remain a united India, it must be an India where this diversity is celebrated and valued. Where we say to ourselves, yes, we have a lot to learn about other people in our own country and how they do things differently. And they have a lot to learn about us. But it doesn't matter. We're all together. We're all the same place. Ultimately, we must all dream the same dreams together and take our country forward. So an India of tomorrow which celebrates diversity, which gives people of India a decent life to lead, which has development and progress, which has the capacity to respect each other, to understand that others have different ways of seeing the truth. An India in which we can actually learn how to adjust to new ways of doing things. Such an India that is unafraid of either the prowess or the products of the outside world. This India can grow and develop and be the true India of tomorrow for all of us. I'm going to stop there, but I'll be very happy to take any questions or comments, particularly from the students and not just the teachers in this audience. My congratulations to the uh, Farooq College Old Boys, Old Students Association for having got us all together here today. Thank you all very much. And Jehan. We are gratified by how you've given us the pleasure of your presence and speech. For sir and the managing committee, Staff and students of Farooq College will cherish your visit and we thank you wholeheartedly at this moment. We will start the interactive session now. Yes, let's do that. Is there a mic in the audience? Uh, okay. Irkele, Shere. Hello, sir. Assalamu alaikum and namaste. A very warm, hard welcome from this side, Adnan Sadat from Afghanistan and being a student of commerce, BBA, pursuing my degree, uh, bachelor degree and... You're from India Afghanistan? Home. Yes, sir. Welcome. Welcome to India. Thank you so much, sir. It's a great pleasure. How long have you been studying here? It has been three years. Three years? Here. Yes, sir. What's your subject? Uh, BBA. Excellent. Okay. Thank you the so managers much. Managers of the future. Okay. Thank good. you so much. It's your great honor. So it has been a great honor being having a few words in front of such a sophisticated figure. And uh, as per the previous situations and previous relations, strategic uh, relations, economic and educational relations, and support of Afghanistan, uh, Afghanistan in India. So. India being a country, a very friendly country to Afghanistan government as always, economically and also in the aspects of education. So my question refers to the present situations that will India inaugurate the same relations with the present government of Afghanistan, which is a government which 
came by force and not acceptable by the people of the country and a big threat to the future of, of the country. And will India help such a country to take a formal shape in the face of world by inaugurating economic affairs, export and imports and other educational aspects between the countries? Or will India start the economic affairs for the remaining assets of India when Taliban take over the country? That is my question, sir. Thank you so Thank much. you very much, uh, young man. And first of all, I wish you well as you uh, help make your own future at this challenging time. Afghanistan has been of special interest to India throughout, as you're probably aware. We are, in fact, uh, a country which have our largest single development assistance program ever has been to Afghanistan. A successive Indian government spent two and a half billion dollars with a B. Uh, of taxpayers' money in development projects in Afghanistan. It is because of Indian engineers that uh, Kabul has 24-7 electricity. They manage a string uh, electricity cable from Pule Charki all the way to Kabul. Similarly, they built the Zaranj Dalaram Highway, cutting across southwestern Afghanistan. There was no highway there before. They were able to build the Salma Dam, which is the biggest dam in Afghanistan. They were able to actually build the Afghan parliament, which has been built by Indians. And on top of all that, there were a number of other smaller projects, maternal and child health hospitals, girls' schools, various kinds of projects. So two and a half billion dollars of assistance. I think that it's a very sincere indication of India's strong commitment to the people of Afghanistan. Now, having done all of that, of course, uh, India naturally did not expect to see the Taliban coming back to power. Most of this expenditure was done in the last 20 years when the International Security Assistance Force, led by the Americans, was still in the country. But when they pulled out and the, and the other countries followed, as you know, the Taliban marched in and on the 15th of August they took over the country. India, like many, many democracies at that time, withdrew their embassy. Everybody got on a plane and came out. Then we started saying, but can we afford to be completely absent from Afghanistan? Because after all, Afghanistan is a member of SARC, is a neighboring country for us. We have vital interests there. Uh, historically, Afghanistan and India have had close relations. I don't know whether you have read Ravindranath Tagore's famous short story, The Kabuliwala. Kabuliwalas used to come all the way down the Grand Trunk Road as far as Calcutta to sell fruit and carpets and all sorts of handicrafts from Afghanistan. There's a long history of interaction. And so finally, just a couple of weeks ago, last month I think it was, that we sent some diplomats back to Kabul. We have not sent an ambassador because we do not recognize the Taliban government yet. But we felt that having no presence in the country was also unwise because India has an obligation to be present in Afghanistan and that's what we have done. I will say that uh, the whole world is in a wait and watch mode. The one area on which I think I personally disagree with international policy so far is in the failure to provide humanitarian assistance to the Afghan people. The Afghan people are suffering terribly. There is a great deal of starvation and malnutrition. We're hearing horror stories of Afghan families selling their children because they can't afford to feed them. And those children then end up as basically slaves in other people's homes. It's a terrible, terrible situation. So we feel that the money of Afghanistan that is frozen in bank accounts, particularly in the US and Western countries, that should be released for humanitarian supplies, food and medicines that can be supplied to the Afghan people. And I must say that the conditions in Afghanistan would warrant that. India has been historically giving humanitarian aid. Uh, and we have done so, uh, especially through Pakistan, when the Pakistanis have not blocked our transport. Otherwise, we've done it by ship, which is a longer route, and we're willing to do it by air as well. We would like to help the Afghan people. But on the questions that you, the longer term questions in the back of your mind, I would say it's very difficult to predict right now because our experience with the last Taliban government was very bad. In, when they were in power for five years, apart from all the hostility towards India, there was also the hijacking of an Indian Airlines plane to Kandahar, where, as you may know, two Indian passengers were killed. 
and then finally Pakistani terrorists were handed over to the Taliban in exchange for getting the plane and the passengers back. It was a terrible experience. And when a country participates in hijacking, that becomes a very serious international crime. Very difficult for us to sit here and forget all these things. So I would say to you, let us wait and see how things evolve in Afghanistan. If there is some way we can support the Afghan people without necessarily taking sides in this difficulty uh, that the Taliban is imposed by their takeover of the country, uh, then we would do so. But the difficulty is that there is no prospect at the moment for anybody else overthrowing the Taliban. Uh, there, is, there used to be a small rebellion in Panjshir, but that has been pretty much wiped out. And now that uh, Pakistan has patched up with Iran and so on, there is no support base for any other rebellion in the neighboring countries. So my own view is we'll have to learn to live with the Taliban, and the Taliban in turn will have to learn to live with the rest of the world. Otherwise, it's the people of Afghanistan who would suffer. We'll have to find some way out that protects the human beings there without endorsing uh, the somewhat uh, evil system that has been imposed upon them. Good morning, sir. Good morning, everyone. I am Lulu S. Kapil, a teacher by profession. While listening to your talk, I could listen that teachers should not teach children how to, what to think, but how to think. That should be the policy. So, with the progressive development of communication technology, there is definitely a change in the media behavior. Social media has led to negative changes in human behavior. For example, while I noticed my children, I used to see that they were self-obsessed, they were narcissistic, they were lazy sometimes, and they are actually depressed, perhaps. They don't know, they have lost their trust. So, I would like to ask, I would like to know, what should be the role of to make our students react intellectually to the social issues by becoming responsible? Thank you, teacher. Thank you, professor. That's a very good question, to which there is no easy answer. Social media is a reality of our times. We cannot escape it. Uh, what we can do, I think, as, a, as teachers, is to try and compensate for what we know the children are getting in social media by offering them other forms of experience. For example, social media privileges short attention spans. You know, Twitter is 280 characters, Instagram stories come and go, uh, even Facebook posts are rarely very long. What we can do is get them into the habit of long-form reading through assignments of school uh, and college work, which will enable them to read longer pieces of literature and to engage with it. Ask them questions that take advantage of that narcissism you described by asking them how they feel. Don't ask them to explain how the writer has felt and what the writer has tried to say. Let them read a long-form essay and then tell them, tell you as a teacher how they felt about it, what they might have done differently, how they would have reacted in the circumstances described in the essay. So that's an example of how an English teacher can both compensate for the short attention span promoted by social media and can take advantage of the narcissism to force the student to think. My whole point about how to think is that we must move away from a mindset where there is a fixed question and a fixed answer to getting people to think of their own answers. In other words, what we need is not just in education that teaches children to answer the questions. We must get them to question the answers and sometimes to come up with the questions themselves. For that, a lot depends on how you set the assignments. And my advice certainly would be to do it this way. Force them to think for themselves about everything they read. And if they think that they can just mug up a few answers and pass your exam, that won't work now. Because you've asked them to read a 3,000, 4,000, 5,000 word text. And then you've asked them how they feel about certain things in that text. How they might behave differently. 
They have to interrogate themselves and come back to you with their findings. To my mind, that's one way forward to address the dilemma that you've explained to us today. Good morning, sir. The firstly, a thank to God giving these happiest moments in my life. In the Chodhyam, in India Rajam, politics is a madam kadandu virinandi. And a madatine kadatu it, Janangal Kedail, Druvigar and a Sobao, in that the government of Valera Adigam Narathikundirikuno. And I'll put the Udangalil in the Madate Martinurti, Janangal Kedail, Shastra Bodo, Yukti Chindayum, Valartan Agrich, Viluru Mahana Irnu, Nehuru. Our Nehuru in the India, and I'll tell you the other until Ethinil Kuna India. Namana Barana Gadana would go Shikuna, Article Ambati. Only a Anusha Sikunda, Janangal Kedail, scientific temper, Adavolatan, rationality, Valartuga and the Ladana. My question is this for molding a creative and progressive society, a country that Nehru dreamed for. Sir, how we can nurture scientific temper and rationality while religion dominates everywhere in India? I want to know what will be a way out from this confusion situation, especially scientists, ISR uh, scientists, uh, to inescapably fall in religious rigid mentality. Thank you so much, sir. Excellent question because I share your concern. I share your concern personally. I believe that we are in a country where the constitution has provided very clearly that we're all free to pursue our own religious hopes, dreams, commitments. We can worship as we like. We can even propagate our faiths. We can do whatever we want according to the Constitution. But it is not the business of the state because it is our personal business. So to my mind, religion should not be an era for political contestation. My personal view is Politics should stay out of religion and religion should be kept out of politics. It should be purely for individuals. Politics should be about how to organize our society and our economy better. Where you may have one view, I may have a different view. We argue in front of the voters that your view is better, my view is better. It doesn't matter whether you and I are the same religion or different religions, religion is irrelevant. It is about society, about economics, about the future. That's what politics is about. The classic definition of politics is about contestation over how to improve society. That is what politics is supposed to be. I have my vision of a better India. You have your vision of a better India. We argue it out. And we are not a country in our constitution where either of us can say we want to have a Hindu state or an Islamic state or a Christian state. That's not the country. That's not what the constitution provides for. The constitution provides for essentially a democratic secular state where religion has its place outside the realm of politics. That's my personal view. On the question of scientific temper, this was of course an aspiration. And how do you inculcate scientific temper? It's a very, very interesting debate. Before 1000 AD, India was a very, very important site of scientific experiment. If you look at the advances made by ancient India in surgery, in astronomy, in metallurgy, in bricklaying, in urban planning, it was an amazing society. And the documents that have survived from the past show India to be a highly advanced place scientifically. We know this also from the work of Arab travelers who came here, people like Ibn Battuta, people who traveled and picked up Indian texts, Indian mathematics. For example, Al Khwarzimi took away Indian texts to the Arab world, translated them, and that's how the world got Indian numbers as Arabic numbers, because the Arabs learned it from us. Sci the manufacture of what was called Ukka steel in, in, in Karnataka. Ukka steel became Learned by the Arabs became Damascus steel, which became world famous through Europe. So you've had this tremendous Indian capacity for scientific innovation. But unfortunately, thanks principally to some of the stagnation 
uh, in, the, in the middle period and subsequently British colonial rule, which broke the back of Indian scientific advances and the British instilled in us that everything good had to be done in Britain. We ended up losing that and we needed after independence to recapture it. Part of our problem was lack of resources. Seven Indians in the sciences have won Nobel Prizes while holding foreign passports. They have held the passports of America or Britain and they have won Nobel Prizes. But they were born and brought up and educated in India first. People like Hargobind Khurana, people like uh, uh, Dr. Chandrasekhar, people like most recently Sir Venkatram and Ramakrishnan, all these people are people who come from India, study the core sciences, but because we didn't have the resources and the facilities to enable them to do their kind of research and their kind of scientific work, they went off, emigrated, settled in other countries where they could do so, and they won Nobel Prizes. They became world leaders in their fields. We can do this too. After all, the brains are the same. What has been lacking now is an enabling ecosystem to permit them to develop the scientific temper and set an example to others. That's gradually changing. When I was minister, for example, I was very struck to see an experiment, an astrophysics telescope in Indore, IIT Indore, which was one of two in the world. The other one was in Houston, which had the capacity to do incredibly important scientific experiments uh, using this very, very powerful telescope and focusing on the skies. Now, I don't understand enough of astrophysics to explain to you what they were doing. But what was interesting was that the professor leading that project had a tenure track position at one of the leading American universities. He had been attracted to come back to India to work on this. The seven doctoral students who were assisting him had all got scholarships to American universities but had chosen to stay in India to work on this. I remember there was a, a, a team leader, was a postdoc called Muhammad Mohsin, I think, who was from a village just a few kilometers away from IIT Indore. He had won a full scholarship and fellowship from seven American universities, MIT, Caltech, all the top ones. And he had turned them down to stay here and work with this professor on this astrophysics project. So I thought, this is inspiring. I don't know what has come of that project since. But the fact that this is possible in India, that people can come from a country like America and find a project as good as that in India and work at that level, that would be the kind of example we can set to more students and come and join them. And similarly, we should be able, or inshallah, as one might say, to have similar islands of excellence in different parts of the country, which can be inspirational examples to others. We all need examples to follow. If people can say, we can do the best here, then they won't need to go elsewhere. And if they work on the sciences here, others will follow that example. Others will try and, uh, 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 shall we say, set up more examples to follow. We need more outstanding examples of scientific accomplishment in India so that more and more of our students will want to emulate those examples rather than to just get on a plane and go elsewhere saying India is going to be a, a, a backward-looking society and we will pursue science elsewhere. But the political contribution is also important. Our leaders, our ruling party and so on must take steps to ensure that it is this kind of scientific work that is publicized and admired rather than the kind of nonsense we see in the media uh, in which superstitions and old uh, uh, sort of practices of using cow dung to bathe in and say it will cure you of all illnesses, all that sort of thing, which moves away from scientific ways of thinking. That should not be propagated by our ruling establishment or by the media. Instead, we should publicize these success stories that show that we are capable of matching the best in the world when it comes to these sciences. Okay, good afternoon, sir. Ipum India ni lori karan sahaja ni anda baru ini nanti India ada barangan garan ni yang terlibat pada ini. Adalah ni kalau ni orang orang pergi ke mana, cody orang orang pergi ke mana, barangan adik adik ni lala. Jangan orang kau ini terhadap tu lalu ni di lebih malah tu orang India ni. 
ഇന്ത്യ ജനാധിപത്യ ഇന്ത്യയുടെ അതല്ലെങ്കിൽ വൈവിധ്യങ്ങളുടെ ഇന്ത്യയുടെ അതിജീവനം എത്രത്തോളം സാധ്യമാണ് ശരിക്ക് ചോദ്യം മനസ്സിലായോന്നും അറിയില്ല നമ്മുടെ ജനാധിപത്യത്തിൽ എന്താ താങ്കൾ പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ആഗ്രഹിച്ച് അറിയാം അതായത് നമ്മുടെ ജനാധിപത്യത്തിൽ നേതാക്കൾ ലീഡേഴ്സ് കളറിനെ ഭയപ്പെടുകയാണ് അതുപോലെ അവരുടെ സൗണ്ടിനെ ഭയപ്പെടുകയാണ് മീഡിയയുടെ ഭയപ്പെടുകയാണ് ചോദ്യങ്ങൾ ചോദിക്കുന്ന ആളുകളെ പിടിച്ചിടുകയാണ് അങ്ങനെയുള്ളൊരു സാഹചര്യത്തിൽ ഇന്ത്യ ടുമോറോ അതല്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇന്ത്യയുടെ അതിജീവനം ജനാധിപത്യത്തിൽ തന്നെയുള്ള അതിജീവനം എത്രത്തോളം സാധ്യമാണ് നമുക്കിനി അല്ല അത് നല്ലൊരു ചോദ്യം തന്നെ പക്ഷെ ആ ചോദ്യത്തിൽ ഞാൻ നിങ്ങളെ എവിടെയും പിടിച്ചിടാൻ പോകുന്നില്ല ഇതുപോലെ ചോദിക്കണം ചോദിച്ചുകൊണ്ടിരിക്കണം അല്ല താങ്കൾ പറയുന്നത് ശരിയാണ് ചില ഭാഗത്തിൽ നമുക്ക് പിന്നെ കാ നമ്മൾ കാണുന്നത് ശരിക്കൊരു നാണക്കേഴാണ് ചില സംസ്ഥാന സർക്കാരുകൾ ചില കേന്ദ്ര നേതാക്കളും കൂടി ഈ ഒരു ജനാധിപത്യ അവകാശമായിട്ട് നമ്മൾക്ക് രാഷ്ട്രീയക്കാരോട് ചോദ്യം ചോദിക്കാനുണ്ട് പക്ഷെ ആ ചോദ്യം ചോദിക്കുമ്പോൾ എന്തായിരിക്കും അതിൻ്റെ ഒരു കോൺസിക്വൻസ് നമ്മൾക്ക് നമ്മൾക്ക് തന്നെ പറയാൻ സാധിക്കുന്നില്ല പണ്ട് കാലത്ത് യുഗാൻഡയുടെ ഒരു ഡിക്റ്റേറ്റർ ഇ ഡി എ മീൻ പറഞ്ഞിട്ടുണ്ടായിരുന്നു വി ഹാവ് ഫ്രീഡം ഓഫ് സ്പീച്ച് ബട്ട് ഐ കനോട്ട് ഗ്യാരൻറ്റി ഫ്രീഡം ആഫ്റ്റർ സ്പീച്ച് പറഞ്ഞാൽ നിങ്ങൾ ഇഷ്ടംപോലെ പറഞ്ഞോളൂ അത് കഴിഞ്ഞിട്ട് നിങ്ങൾക്ക് ലി ലിബർട്ടി ഉണ്ടാവും ഫ്രീഡം ഉണ്ടാവും എനിക്ക് പറയാൻ സാധിക്കാം നിങ്ങൾ ഒരു പക്ഷേ ജയിലിടുന്നതാണ് അതായിരുന്നു ആൾക്കാരുടെ ഭയം അത് നമ്മുടെ ഭാരതത്തിൽ നമ്മൾ ഒരിക്കലും ഉണ്ടാകും നമ്മൾ ജനാധിപത്യമാണെങ്കിൽ ജനാധിപത്യ പ്രകാരം എല്ലാവർക്കും എന്ത് വേണം ചോദിക്കുക എന്ത് വേണം പറയാം പക്ഷെ ഇപ്പം നമ്മളുടെ ഒരു ഇൻടോളറൻസ് കൂടിക്കൂടി വരുന്നുണ്ടെന്നൊരു സംശയമില്ല അത് ചില ഭാഗത്തിൽ ആൾക്കാർ പറയുന്നത് നമ്മുടെ രാജ്യത്തിൽ ഞാൻ ഒഫൻഡഡ് ആണെന്ന് പറയാനാണ് എൻ്റെ അവകാശം അപ്പം നിങ്ങൾ എൻ്റെ ദൈവത്തെക്കുറിച്ച് അതും പറഞ്ഞു ഓ ഇങ്ങനെ ഒരു ചോദ്യം ചോദിച്ചു അത് ശരി ഞാൻ ഒഫൻഡഡ് ആണ് അവർ ജയിലിൽ കൊണ്ടുപോയിടൂ അതിൽ അർത്ഥമില്ലാത്തൊരു കാര്യം ഒരു ജനാധിപത്യത്തെ അങ്ങനെ ഒരിക്കലും സംഭവിക്കുന്നില്ല പക്ഷേ അതിൻ്റെ ഉദാഹരണങ്ങൾ കൂടുതലായിട്ടുണ്ട് എൻ്റെ അഭിപ്രായത്തിൽ ഇതിലാണ് നമ്മളുടെ ജുഡീഷ്യറിക്ക് വലിയൊരു റോളുള്ളത് കാരണം ജഡ്ജിമാർക്ക് അറിയാം ഒരു ഭരണഘടത്ത് എന്താ കഴിഞ്ഞിരിക്കണ നിയമപ്രകാരം എന്താണ് ലോ പറയുന്നത് അതനുസരിച്ചിട്ടല്ലേ ആക്ഷൻ എടുക്കേണ്ടൂ ഒരു ഗ്രാമത്തിലത്തെ ഒരു പോലീസ് സ്റ്റേഷൻ്റെ ഒരു സബ് ഇൻസ്പെക്ടർ അറിവില്ലെങ്കിലും അവർ ചെയ്യുന്ന തെറ്റിനെ നമ്മൾ വേഗം മാറ്റിയിട്ട് പിന്നെ ഇങ്ങനെ അറസ്റ്റ് ചെയ്ത വ്യക്തിയിൽ ബെയിൽ കൊടുത്തിട്ട് ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള കേസ് ഡിസ്മിസ് ചെയ്യണത് ആ ഉത്തരവാദിത്തം ജഡ്ജസിൻ്റെ കയ്യിലാണ് വന്നിരിക്കുന്നത് ഇപ്പം നമ്മുടെ സിസ്റ്റമിൽ ഇൻ തിയറി എക്സിക്യൂട്ടീവും ലെജിസ്ലേറ്റീവും ജുഡീഷ്യറിയും വേറെ വേറെയാണ് യാഥാർത്ഥത്തിൽ അത് ശരിയല്ല കാരണം ലെജിസ്ലേറ്റും നമ്മുടെ പാർലമെൻ്ററി സിസ്റ്റം ആയ കാരണം ഒരു ലെജിസ്ലേച്ചറിനെ ഇലക്ട് ചെയ്ത ശേഷം പിന്നെ അവർ എക്സിക്യൂട്ടീവ് ചെയ്തതിനെ അവർ പറയാൻ ഇപ്പോഴത്തെ കേന്ദ്ര സ്ഥിതി നോക്കിക്കോളൂ ഭൂരിപക്ഷണം ബി ജെ പി ആണ് സർക്കാർ ബി ജെ പി ആണ് അപ്പോൾ സർക്കാർ പറഞ്ഞതേ ഭൂരിപക്ഷം ചെയ്യുള്ളൂ അവർക്കത് ചെയ്തിട്ടില്ലെങ്കിൽ ഇപ്പോൾ നമ്മുടെ ആൻറ്റി ഡിഫക്ഷൻ ലോ പ്രകാരം അവർ തള്ളാം പാർലമെൻറ്റിൽ നിന്ന് അപ്പോൾ അവർ സർക്കാർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ അവർ വോട്ട് ചെയ്യുള്ളൂ സർക്കാർ പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ അവർ ചെയ്യുള്ളൂ ആ സ്ഥിതിയിൽ നമ്മൾക്ക് ശരിക്കും ഒരു ഇൻഡിപെൻഡൻറ്റ് ഇൻസ്റ്റിറ്റ്യൂഷൻ ആയിരിക്കുന്നത് ജുഡീഷ്യറിയാണ് ഇപ്പോൾ ജഡ്ജിമാർ ഇങ്ങനെ പറഞ്ഞാൽ ഇത് ചെയ്യണത് ശരിയല്ല എന്ന് പറഞ്ഞാൽ ആർക്കും ജഡ്ജിമാരെ ഒന്നും ചെയ്യാൻ സാധിക്കില്ല അവർക്ക് അത് ചെയ്യാൻ ആൾക്കാരെ ഫ്രീ ചെയ്യാനുള്ള അവകാശം അവർക്കാണുള്ളത് അവരും ഒരു ഒരു ഉത്തരവാദിത്വം എടുത്തിട്ട് ഇഫ് ദേ കെൻ സെറ്റ് എ ഗുഡ് എക്സാമ്പിൾ അങ്ങനെയായാൽ രാഷ്ട്രീയക്കാർ വീണ്ടും ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങൾ ചെയ്യണം മുമ്പ് ചിന്തിക്കുന്നതാണ് നമ്മുടെ ആഗ്രഹം പക്ഷേ ഇത് സംഭവിക്കുന്നതേ മോശം തന്നെയാണ് താങ്കൾ ചോദിച്ചതിൽ പിന്നെ അൺഫോർച്ചുനേറ്റ്ലി ഈ ഒരു റിയാലിറ്റി ഉള്ളത് ഒരു യാഥാർത്ഥ്യമുള്ളത് നമ്മുടെ ജനാധിപത്യത്തിന് ഒരു നാണക്കേട് തന്നെയാണ് ദിസ് ഷുഡ് നോട്ട് ഹാപ്പൻ പക്ഷെ അതാണ് നമ്മൾ സത്യം എന്താ ചെയ്യുക ഇപ്പോൾ ജഡ്ജിമാരാണ് നമ്മളെല്ലാവരും രക്ഷിക്കാൻ പോകുന്നതാണ് എൻ്റെ എൻ്റെ ഒരു ഒരു അഭിപ്രായം എല്ലാ രാഷ്ട്രീയക്കാരും മാത്രം വിട്ടു കൊടുത്താൽ അവർ അവരിഷ്ടക്കേടും അവർക്ക് ഇഷ്ടമില്ലായ്മ ഒക്കെ ചെയ്തിട്ട് ആൾക്കാർ ജയിലിൽ കൊണ്ട് ഇടന്ന് തുടങ്ങിയാൽ ഈ ജനാധിപത്യത്തിന് ഭാവി ഉണ്ടാവില്ല സോറി Good afternoon, sir. Myself, Muhammad Hibatullah
uh, these harmful behaviors and also so are there any steps you can take to address these situations thank you sir you know the, uh, difficult for me to do much to address the situation because as an opposition mp i have my limitations um, many of the lakshadweep leaders of both the congress and the ncp and others have come to see me in delhi have given me petitions which i have in turn taken up with the government with the home ministry and so on but the problem is that of course the lakshadweep government is uh, directly controlled by a, uh, an administrator imposed by delhi and so essentially the central government's writ is what runs in lakshadweep and they have a certain vision which they are trying to implement which ignores the social realities of lakshadweep and which seems to ignore the way in which lakshadweep has traditionally lived so a number of things done by this particular administrator praful patel have caused a great deal of consternation there have been articles in the media and i myself have raised issues uh, the difficulty at the moment is that lakshadweep frankly is a rather small part of our country and after a short while people's attention moves on to bigger problems uh, in some ways it used to be your great advantage no one bothered you because you were so small but now uh, no one is also necessarily coming to your rescue uh, there was if i remember correctly a supreme court case against certain decisions taken by the administrator and also i may be wrong but i believe the supreme court case was decided in your favor i think that if i'm not i was i mistaken uh, the case is not over in some kinds of cases like that in some cases there are more cases pending is it yes i say okay well so the point is that once again the judiciary may come to our rescue but the difficulty is that the normal processes of democracy in lakshadweep are limited by the unusual administrative and constitutional arrangements there the second factor is you have only one mp no sorry you have two mps i beg your pardon right no you have two because uh, we have uh, uh, kuldeep uh, sharma oh, no that andamans you're right lakshadweep is only one faisal only faisal is there that's right so then that means that he has the responsibility of speaking for you all nationally and raising these issues i'll also have a word with him and see what success he's been able to have in addition to raising them in parliament he could take a delegation of sympathetic mps and go and see a minister many of us will be happy to support him thank you Hello, sir. I'm Janat Fazli. Uh, I've been told it'll be the last three questions, so I'm afraid after that we'll have to stop because it's now late. But you okay. go ahead. Okay, so it was good that I rushed in. So <laughs> I'm Janat Fazli, a BA English student, and I am a writer myself. So I would like to ask you: You are both a writer and a politician, among many other things. So, what do you think is, you know, when comparing between the position of a writer and that of a politician what do you think is the better you know position to make an impact in the world <laughs> or also in our country especially you know given the current situation and the political and cultural situation what is your opinion a very sweet question thank you i mean i must say that uh, personally the writing matters more to me as i have sometimes said uh, i'm already a former minister one day i'll be a former mp but i hope i'll never be a former writer the writing is what keeps me uh, and it'll always be there in the shelves but having said that let me say that writers only reach the people who read and very few people in our society are reading anymore so if you want to make an impact on the masses on the millions then you need to try and use politics more than writing for that my writing i hope reaches people like you and through you i hope i will have an indirect impact on larger numbers of people if i can affect your mind with my ideas you will take my ideas into your lives and your work but politics means that you can help and benefit even those who don't read you and that means you can help influence the passage of laws and making of policies and so on and that's why i try and do both it's not easy and one day you know the politics will have to come to an end 
But as long as I still have the spirit and the spark and the determination to make a difference, I will try and do that in the name of people like you. Thank you for your question. Thank you. And also, sir, you, I just want to ask you another question. It's, you can just answer it with a yes or a no. And you're completely free to say no. You don't have to feel pressurized because I'm asking this in a public place. My question is, can I give you a copy of my book? Yes, of course, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. My name is Kalim Allah Khan, student of BBA and Farooq College from Afghanistan. I have a two questions, sir. Uh, we know that India has played a significant role in the reconstruction, rehabilitation, and regional stability of Afghanistan. But why the political settlement of Indian government is currently weak in Afghanistan? And another question is, what are the future plans of Indian government for Afghanistan? And at the end, I would like to thank the Indian government and Indian nation for maintaining such a good relationship with Afghan people and with the previous uh, Afghan government. And I believe that with the support and help of uh, India, Afghanistan people will be able to have a competition with any country in the world in the future. Wonderful. Thank you for those kind words. I've already answered this question. The very first question I got was on Afghanistan. I talked about India's extensive development assistance program, the recent uh, putting of a new presence in, in Kabul, and our challenges in working with the Taliban. So I think I won't repeat myself since so many people have heard the answer. But good luck to you, and I certainly hope that you will come out of Farooq College all the better to be able to serve the people of Afghanistan. Good luck to you. So this is me, Sohil Shokat, and uh, I'm doing BBA from uh, for college, and I come from a place which is called Heaven on Earth. Sorry, a place called? I'm, I come from the place which is called Heaven on Earth, that's uh -huh. Kashmir. Okay. And now people call us terrorists, stone palaters, anti-Indian, so on. So, you know, having this, keeping this, all this aside, let's come to India. If we talk about to India, in India today, so, India were 70% population are poor and the country which has more than 614 billion external debt from other countries are World Bank or IM, uh, oh, other places. So, the country were Prime Minister spending more than 3,000 crore for his residence. He is spending more than 1,300 1, crore for his uh, house in Delhi, such things are happening in the country, but we never look in the matter for the poor people in, the, in India. So now, sir, if we talk about India tomorrow, and you are the one who can get chance to be the Prime Minister of India. So tomorrow, India tomorrow. We are talking about tomorrow, and you are the Prime Minister of India tomorrow. So what will be the first step towards the development of India? <laughs> Because, sir, we know that we got fed up living in India today. We, even I want suicide, I want to fly away from Kashmir or India. So we are expecting something new that's called India tomorrow. And I'm giving you a chance to be the Prime Minister. What will the first step <laughs> for the India? Thank you. It'll take a lot more votes than just yours, my friend. But thank you very much for the vote of confidence. No, I think, uh, first of all, on Kashmir, uh, you know, I, I know you've been through a lot. And I'm glad to see Kashmiri student here at uh, Varu College. I hope I wish you and your family well. I have known your state. I was married to somebody from Kashmir, my late wife. I can tell you that your many, many beautiful advantages in that state, which unfortunately politics and other things have prevented uh, the full-fledged full fulfillment of your potential, and I hope that will happen soon. But as far as India overall is concerned, I would say the first priority uh, for the government has to be, beyond any shadow of a doubt, to move forward simultaneously on what I call both the hardware of development and the software of development. The hardware of development the present government is doing, that is roads, highways, ports, airports, the hard infrastructure. You need that for any development to happen as a basis, as a foundation. But what they have not done enough on is the software of development, that is what? Healthcare. There are still millions of people in our country, in fact, hundreds of millions, who do not have a primary health center within a five-kilometer walk of their places of residence. Education. 
there are still not enough opportunities for everyone who wants to get a decent education. And too many people are wasting money on the wrong kinds of education. We need education that will equip people to take advantage of the opportunities that the 21st century offers. We have, for example, a so-called demographic dividend. More young people ready to start work than any other country in the world, even China. But they're not equipped to take advantage because we haven't given them the training, the education, and the skills to be able to do that. So education, healthcare, and frankly, this kind of element is what I would call the investment in human capital. Let everybody have meaningful work. Let them be able to pursue their aspirations through being able to work for it. It is not only about giving welfare, it is about creating jobs. Not enough has been done on that. So the hardware of development is progressing and that's good, but the software of development needs much, much more work and that needs uh, to be done. And that's something which I'm really hoping and counting on uh, a new government to be able to do for the India of tomorrow. I really have to make one last question. I'm getting signals from everywhere that I have to go. So last Sorry question, good luck to all of you. Sorry to interrupt. Uh, we will take the last question now. Hello, sir. So much thank you for accepting my question. Dear sir, I'm Amal Abdurrahman. I'm doing my research in astrophysics at Faro College. My question is on women, the women of the country and the world. Uh, being a woman, observing the women around, uh, I find her life much tough, disturbing and at the same time confusing to express. In every spaces of human interaction, starting from the very home, she is tortured physically, intellectually, morally, socially and politically. Being a person in academia, I can say the thing is not different. The things are quite worse there too. So, this implies that the very materialization of woman and devaluing of her intellect is much rooted in the ultra-modern civilization compared to the nomadic ages of human history. So, so my question is, or the query is, seeing this room filled with a lot of women and sad to say usually we see a stage with very few number of women, can you, can I expect uh, a tomorrow wherein a woman is a human? My question is wherein a woman is a human. Thank you. I think the short answer is yes. As long as there are women like you, I'm not worried about the future of women in India. No, you're quite right. Uh, women have to get their due. You know, I've been very struck. In the last 10, 15 years, I've been at a lot of university convocations, giving away prizes, certificates, and so on. I've been very struck to see in every year an increasing number of women, not just among the student body, but particularly among those who are topping the university, those who are winning the prizes, the dean's list, the gold medals, the women are dominating. In fact, I worry about the future of men in the India of tomorrow because they're going to have to work extra hard just to keep up. In all the fields, medicine, engineering, I've spoken of the dental colleges, in every field I find women are doing better than men. Now what happens is somehow, after graduation, society seems to press down on their talents and their aspirations. And in the working world, the men seem to overtake the women. The same women who have overtaken them at the educational stage seem to get overtaken in the workplace. And that's something which requires society to both introspect and act. Are we not giving women enough opportunities? Does the expectation on women to get married, have children, look after the family as a first priority, does that impede their progress professionally? Should we, if necessary, have laws to compensate for that? Should we say that for every year that a woman loses for childbearing uh, or, or every number of years that is set aside for child rearing, that there should be a relative adjustment in company seniority and so on so that the woman is able to compete on an equal basis with a male manager who didn't have to take the time off to have a child to raise a family. I mean, we must find creative ways of addressing this challenge. To my mind, in our society, we have by and large been able to overcome the traditional prejudices because in our country we have always been used to seeing, for example, women lawyers, women doctors, women CEOs, now we have women pilots. We even have women combat pilots in the Air Force and we've got uh, women in the front ranks of the Army and the, and the Navy as well for the first time. 
there is a recognition in India now that women can do everything and that it is only the prejudices of men that are holding the women back. But at the same time, the woman should have the right to decide what she wants to do and what she is not prepared to do. Women have, the, they have that right because they've earned it. I mean, there's a whole, uh, there's an African proverb that says women hold up half the sky. My answer is that is not true. They hold up the whole sky. We men are the ones who are largely superfluous, frankly, to the process of running the world because the women are the ones who are able to do everything that men are able to do. And as technology moves forward and reduces the emphasis on muscle power, the one advantage men had over women was their physical strength and brawn. That is no longer relevant to 99% of the professions in the world. Even the military now requires people who are more technologically skilled than muscular. You need to press the right buttons and you point the gun or the plane. Uh, that women can do that just as well as men. So increasingly I tell men, there is nothing a man can do that a woman cannot do. And let us accept therefore that to keep women down and out is actually counterproductive because society is denying itself the skills and talents of half its population. So I'm in your corner. I'm very proud to say I'm also a feminist. Keep speaking out as you have been doing. Be strong. I'm confident that you will succeed and with you, the women of Kerala and the women of India will make great progress in the future in the India of tomorrow. Thank you all very, very much. Dr. Shashi Tharoor has a unique blend of wit, charm and intelligence. Farooq College just witnessed that. A pleasure indeed. As a token of our appreciation, we will present our chief guest, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, with select books published by Farooq College Publication Division. May I request our principal, Dr. K.M. Nasir, to present the books to our chief guest. The General Secretary of FOSA, Dr. P.P. Yusuf Ali, has been extremely resourceful and efficient man of action organizing Abu Sabah Extension Lecture as part of Platinum Jubilee celebrations. It is with great pleasure that I invite Dr. P.P. Yusuf Ali, General Secretary of FOSA, for the word of thanks. So good afternoon, everyone. Here function of Davasani Kiyana. Namasaman Chortolam. In the Intel and Amok Lebica, one of the Livici, yet two Valia Atidiana, Eur Abu Saba extension lecture in the Levicitla. Is Hatta Tele Urandash Rasta figure itula, or international diplomat itula, Matu Yella Nalelum, Yertigar in the Lelum, Rashtia Karan and the Lelum, Yellam Yellam, Yer Precious and Itula. Shashi Saru Sarne, Inger function in Vendita, Kundu in the Vendita, Kanye, and to worship my number of Shamichu Kundirikiana. Adila Yetum Pradana Maita Adinuendi Property Zerla, number of Poro Idarti Gudi Aitala, Ahmad Sachuana, Sir Angade, you are the Ye the Teratelana, Nandi Parenda, the Yangal Karilla. For college, old students association event you. For college, manage committee event you. For college, le mudan athya pogrom vidyarthi gal event you. Nangal de akhaytho mai thola kritakya da arika nyani avasaram ubhi kiyan. Adhe bolten ne yeh re chadangile ke shashi taru sar ne kundu varan event it. Vadre ya digam parishramichit thola namada puro vidyarthi um. For college, old students association de executive committee member gudi ay thola. Ahmad Sajju nolla nangal de kritakya da arika ni avasaram ubhi kundu. Adhe bolten ne. For college old students association num, adhe pare for college manage committee de mudvan member markum, avrede sanitithinum, ee or chadang dhanya maakiya denu lla, nangal de kridakchinda arri kyan, ee avasaram ubi kyan, adhe bole, evde eti jair nitil lla, matyo poorwa vidyarthikal kum, adhyaporkum, poorwa adhyaporkum, rechidakal kum, vidyarthikal kum, adhe nillam parame, evde eti jair nitil lla, mudvan 
മീഡിയ വ്യക്തികൾക്കും ഇതുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് ഇതിൻ്റെ ഓർഗനൈസേഷനുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ട് പ്രവർത്തിച്ചിട്ടുള്ള മുഴുവൻ ആളുകൾക്കും അധ്യാപകർക്കും വിദ്യാർത്ഥികൾക്കും മാനേജിംഗ് കമ്മിറ്റി അംഗങ്ങൾക്കും പ്രത്യേകിച്ച് ഫോസയുമായി ബന്ധപ്പെട്ടുള്ള എല്ലാവർക്കും അഖേതവുമായ നന്ദി പ്രകാശിപ്പിച്ചുകൊണ്ട് ഞാൻ വിടവാങ്ങുന്നു ജയ് ഹിന്ദ് ഐ റിക്വസ്റ്റ് എവറി വൺ ടു റൈസ് ഫോർ ദ നാഷണൽ ആന്തം you've joined us on the occasion may god bless one and all jai hind we request all the students to rem-